Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, the Federal Reserve hikes rates. We'll tell you what it means for your mortgage and credit card loans. Plus, Senate Republicans want to put money back in your pocket. We talked to Senator Declan O'Scanlan about the plan to return billions of dollars to taxpayers. And we put marijuana in focus as New Jersey prepares to roll out its recreational market. We look at what it takes to become a legal retailer, the challenges women face in the weed business, and how one local university is educating a future workforce to compete in the cannabis industry. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. Get ready to pay more if you borrow money. For the first time in more than three years, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates this past week. Rates went up by a quarter point, and the Fed said it's planning on six more rate increases this year. The aggressive timeline comes as inflation has rocketed higher. By increasing interest rates, the Fed is hoping to contain inflation, which it acknowledged could worsen following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've seen evidence of that in rising gas prices. So how does this impact you? Well, your credit card interest rates will go up. Loans with adjustable rates, including private student loans and home equity loans, will go up as well. Higher interest rates can also raise borrowing costs for people buying cars and homes. Mortgage rates have already been on the rise as of late. Businesses will see higher rates for commercial loans. I spoke about that with Peter Dantas, the New Jersey market executive for Wells Fargo. And I think that initial rate increase will not have a, a real material impact on the companies here in New Jersey. That said, our economists here at Wells Fargo are projecting a, a, an increase in rates over the next two years of six to eight more times. So at some point in the near future, by the end of next year, the, the rising rates will start to have an impact. How can companies prepare financially for a rising rate environment, something we haven't seen for a few years, what advice would you give them in terms of how they manage their business? So it really depends on what kind of, of borrowings you have. So for instance, if you're borrowing short term for working capital and it's a variable rate loan, I really would just keep it business as usual. Uh, short term borrowings, you're gonna borrow, you're gonna pay down. It's really just to, to manage working capital and inventory fluctuations. However, if you're borrowing for longer term purposes, such as equipment or real estate, and you're gonna have you know, a longer term asset, I would suggest, and what we're recommending to our clients is to either do a conventional fixed rate loan or to swap to a fixed rate uh, that eliminates interest rate risk over the long term. New Jersey's utility companies can now start sending service shutoff notices to customers who are behind on paying their bills. This past Tuesday, the state's moratorium on utility shutoffs put in place during the pandemic was lifted. What's frustrating officials at both utility companies and the state, there is money available to provide help, but very few people have applied. 
more than a million New Jersey customers collectively owe over $820 million. But so far, only about 10% of struggling customers have asked for help. And eligibility requirements have expanded. Under one state program, a family of four earning about $106,000 would qualify for aid. I think that within the next 30 days, people will actually see their utilities shut off. Nobody wants to shut you off. The idea is this was not a free ride as far as these moratoriums were concerned. It's again, there are many people probably in this situation who have never, never been in this situation before. Get in touch with your utility if you get a shutoff notice. And um, they are more than willing to cooperate with you. New Jersey's economy continued to add more jobs as we began the year. 8,300 new positions were created in January, continuing a 14-month streak of job growth in our state. New Jersey has now recovered nearly 86% of the jobs lost in March and April of 2020 due to the pandemic. Federal data released by the state labor department shows the unemployment rate rose slightly in January to 5.2 percent. During the week ahead, state lawmakers will hold remote public hearings as they begin to review the nearly $49 billion budget put forward by Governor Phil Murphy. Republican lawmakers want to see more money returned to taxpayers. I talked with Senator Declan O'Scanlan about the GOP's initiative known as Give It Back. Senator, New Jersey Republicans have started the Give It Back campaign. What do you hope this campaign accomplishes? I hope it provides relief for the beleaguered taxpayers of New Jersey at a time when they are most acutely feeling the impact of our high cost burden in New Jersey. And we have an opportunity here because our friends on the other side of the aisle have responded to uh, Republicans imploring them to care about these things and finally are doing so. The governor's actually started talking about affordability. Legislative leadership has. Uh, we are hopeful that we're at a moment in time, both when there's willingness to attack these issues, uh, that, that lines up with people's dire need for relief. We see gas prices spiking. We see inflation spiking. Uh, and we have a boatload of cash that we didn't budget for, that was uh, over $4.6 billion in more revenue than we planned to take from taxpayers. So giving that back ought to be one of the easiest decisions we've ever made. So there is actually some legislative moves afoot to do that. Tell me about uh, one bill that has been talked about that would put some money back into residents' pockets, a couple of hundred dollars in terms of tax relief? Well, the, the uh, Argue It Back program would give $500 to individuals, $1,000 to households uh, that, uh, as a credit on their income tax. Uh, it would be very quick. It would happen this spring or, or instantly if we wanted to, to move even faster, uh, you could issue it as a check. Uh, but it's, it's nice, neat, clean, and, and is easy to understand uh, by both um, our tax systems and by residents. So that is what we would enact. That would, right off the bat, put about $3 billion into the hands of New Jersey taxpayers. $1,000 a household goes a long way to offsetting uh, increased gas prices and the other burdens of inflation that have been inflicted on folks over the years and the increased uh, Murphy taxes as well. So obviously Republicans are the minority in the legislature. Are you hearing at all from any of your Democratic colleagues that there could be some movement on this particular piece of legislation? We're hearing that there's interest in moving forward with something. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people looking at ways to try to cut the, the gas tax uh, at this point. Uh, this particular uh, nice, neat, clean, uh, and dramatic move to show taxpayers we care about them has not been embraced yet by the Democrat legislative leadership, uh, which leads me to believe that we might be seeing more lip service than actual service dedication, but we'll see. Senator, good to catch up with you again. Take care. Appreciate it. 
With gas prices at record highs, one Democratic state lawmaker wants to reduce or eliminate the state's gas tax for a period of time. Assemblyman Paul Moriarty has written legislation that would reduce the state gas tax by 50 percent if the average price of a gallon of gas reaches $4.51 during the months of June, July, and August. If gas prices go as high as $5.01 a gallon during the summer months, the state gas tax would be reduced by 75 percent and the tax would be suspended if the price tops $5.50 a gallon. Revenues collected from the gas tax in New Jersey are deposited into the Transportation Trust Fund to support the state's transportation system. To make sure that remains fully funded, the Assemblyman proposes transferring money from the state's sales tax into the Transportation Trust Fund. New Jersey's current gas tax is 42.4 cents a gallon. Governor Murphy is leading a four-day economic trip to Ireland next month. A delegation from the state will visit Dublin and Cork, seeking to drum up business for New Jersey. Murphy and others will meet with leaders in the technology, life sciences, and pharma industries. The mission to the Emerald Isle was announced on St. Patrick's Day. It's not often that a brand new industry blossoms in a state, but here in New Jersey, we are much closer to the start of legal recreational marijuana sales. This past week, the State Cannabis Regulatory Commission began accepting applications from those interested in opening retail shops to sell weed to adults. So we're putting the marijuana market in focus this week. Once New Jersey's market kicks into gear, sales for recreational marijuana are expected to reach $775 million this year, and the market will grow to more than $2 billion by 2026. Meantime, medical marijuana sales are forecast to peak by next year. Certain applications for licenses will be prioritized by the Cannabis Commission, including businesses owned by individuals with past cannabis convictions, those from certain economically disadvantaged areas, and minority-owned and women-owned businesses. Women have made some inroads in the cannabis industry. Close to 20% of all of the nation's cannabis businesses are owned by women, the number of women-owned dispensaries varies widely by state, as you can see here. New Jersey voters approved legalizing pot back in November 2020, and it's taken some time to get to this point. People are eager to get started in the business. Within the first 24 hours after the state began accepting applications for retail cannabis licenses, it received more than 200 applications. I sat down with Jeff Brown, the executive director of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, to find out what happens from here. Jeff, it seems within the first 24 hours of opening applications, you got quite a few of them. What are the latest numbers? When we opened uh, up applications for cultivation sites and product manufacturers in December, uh, we had only received about uh, 135 by uh, the, the morning of the next day. Uh, here, we received over 200 in the first 24 hours. How many applications are you expecting to receive total, or perhaps do you have to um, put your estimates up a bit? There's a tremendous amount of interest here. There's a lot of people who want to get into this nascent industry. Um, there's a lot of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of folks who, you know, uh, you know, are looking to uh, start a new life, start a new business when it comes to cannabis. Uh, and our goal in setting up this market is to uh, really give those entrepreneurs an opportunity to prove themselves uh, in the market, uh, which is why it's a priority for us to get through these applications and start getting licenses issued. So what's the timeline for doing that, working your way through these applications and then delivering licenses? So initially, it's going to be more than 90 days uh, to review applications. And, and we released a pre-application webinar uh, back in December before we started accepting any applications, uh, you know, notified potential applicants that initially it would be more than 90 days to review uh, applications. But our goal is to get that under 90 days, particularly for conditional licenses. Conditional licenses are, are a type of license where an applicant can get an initial, an initial approval from the Cannabis Regulatory Commission before they have to pay for uh, a building, before they they have to get municipal approval. Um, for those, you know, our goal is to get that under 90 days. Uh, you know, this initial influx of license applications uh, just 
given the volume, it's going to take us some additional time, but I'm confident that we'll get reviews under 90 days for conditional licenses, especially. So, of course, the million dollar question is, when are we going to see legal sales kick off in New Jersey? We want to get this done as soon as possible, but it's always been a priority to make sure we're, we're doing our due diligence and setting up this market uh, in a way that is equitable and safe. Um, and, uh, you know, we continue to work, but work at both those, both those values, um, you know, getting these new business applications up and going is critical um, because creating a pathway for new businesses into the market, particularly businesses owned by entrepreneurs who may have uh, past uh, criminal conviction for cannabis or entrepreneurs who are from economically disadvantaged areas, um, giving them a pathway to access success is important to us. Um, and the second piece is, uh, you know, our, our current medical uh, industry has the opportunity to expand into the recreational industry. Um, and so that's, you know, probably going to be the fastest avenue to, to sales, but we want to make sure we're working both simultaneously so that, um, it, you know, there's, pa there's essentially a pathway for new businesses as well as, as a pathway for existing businesses. So I'm just going to push you a little bit. When you say as soon as possible, is that within weeks? I can't commit to a, a, a date. I can't commit to within weeks. I mean, I think we we would love to, to, to see it happen within weeks. But again, we got to balance, uh, I think, our goals of ensuring this is done equitably uh, and compliant with the law. You're going to be busy in the next couple of weeks. So we're glad you spent some time with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Critics of marijuana legalization worry about the potential harm to public health. Edmund DeVoe, president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, is confident that the proper precautions are being set up. Well, we have had a medical marijuana program in place for over a decade. And so there has been no, uh, no reports of, uh, of, of increases in crime or increases uh, in traffic fatalities. So we've had legalized cannabis in New Jersey uh, for over a decade. The sky did not fall. Uh, we, we passed a, a referendum. We put regulations in place. The sky hasn't fallen. Uh, so all of the safeguards that we are continually working on, uh, my association, the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, working, uh, coordinating with the CRC, uh, we are making sure that safeguards are in place. Before any cannabis businesses open their doors, they will need to be staffed up and ready to go. I sat down with Jennifer Maiden, the Assistant Dean of Graduate Business Programs at Rowan University's Rohr College of Business, to learn how the school is preparing its students for cannabis careers. Many people in New Jersey are eagerly awaiting the start of the recreational cannabis industry. Do we have a workforce at the ready for it? There is a lot of interest in getting into the workforce and uh, depending on what training is required, we have some people who are ready with that and then others who are really eager to get into the game. What sort of skills are needed for this new and potentially growing industry? When we think about the skills that are needed, it's everything from um, maybe some of the more uh, obvious or common things that think people think about working in a dispensary, working in a grow facility, but the industry needs everything. They need people coming from areas of accounting and uh, law and supply chain. So they need people to come in from other industries and transfer in skill sets from other industries into the cannabis industry as it's growing. Marketing is uh, also a really big area. And then healthcare and everything related to health and wellness is a whole nother area that there is a great amount of demand and then, of course, there is the research side of things, and that's all different types of research. So some of it might be medical research. Some of it could be social research as well. So at Rowan, what sort of interest are you seeing from your students in pursuing careers in the industry? We see a lot of interest from our students. They're really curious to understand what does it mean to actually get into the industry. Some students are really interested in some of those more obvious things that they're aware of because you see them more often. Talking about uh, either working in a dispensary or running your own dispensary or a growth facility or a distribution um, model of business. But more students are understanding that those ancillary businesses, the accounting, the marketing, the supply chain, those are all really important as well. So the more that our students start to understand what those opportunities are, 
the more that they're showing interest in all of these different areas as well. And how are you catering some of the educational needs so that they're able to go out into the workforce and get that job in cannabis? Uh, we have spent a lot of time talking with people in industry to understand better what is it that they actually need from people coming out of the university setting um, so that they can actually satisfy the job requirements that the industry is going to be interested in. We have put together um, a good number of courses, both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level, in a few different areas. We have some classes um, in the graduate level for the MBA program, for example, in cannabis commercialization. We have a good handful of courses in chemistry at both the graduate and the undergraduate level. We have some classes on the social sciences side where students can start to really explore what does it mean for towns, communities, people, social movements, thinking about uh, the cannabis industry. Another thing that we are just starting to do is working with industry to be guest speakers so that we can actually have industry speak people speaking directly to our students. Well, it's great to hear what's going on at Rowan. And as we watch this industry unfold, I'm sure we'll continue to hear a lot about opportunities in South Jersey and elsewhere. Thanks for your time today. Great. Thank you. If you want to be successful in business, networking can often help. In the cannabis world, one female entrepreneur found there weren't a lot of women in the field, especially right away. So she created a network for women in cannabis to connect with, learn from, and do business with other women. I spoke with Brooke Westlake, who created the Women in Cannabis Expo. Brooke, as the cannabis industry, the recreational industry began to develop, you really saw a need for women to connect. What was missing in terms of the female involvement in cannabis as things began legalizing across the U.S.? When I began in the cannabis industry in 2019 of December, I went to a woman's night at a big conference. And after attending that woman's night, because I was in the process of opening a testing lab, I realized that there was a very big missing component, which was an expo for women. I'd spent some time looking on the internet to actually go and spend money to go and network with women in this industry and could not find anything. And so I developed the Women in Cannabis Expo for women. Uh, men are welcome at our events, but that was what I developed. So now that in New Jersey, we are poised to start a recreational market, how does it look for women in our state? Every state is very different and challenging. I believe that New Jersey has done some funding that they've set aside for fair equity, but there hasn't been any transparency in any of the states that I have worked with as far as who is getting those funds, how are those funds being distri distributed to individuals to women. Uh, more states, as they adopt recreational marijuana, have definitely provided or have included that as part of their law. But it's really a matter of time before we actually see what those outcomes are or who those funds were awarded to. So it will be very interesting because you guys are just getting started and it will take time to really see what happens with how many women go into the industry in your area. What is the challenge for women? Why are we seeing this underrepresentation within cannabis? The biggest challenge with cannabis in overall for women, minorities, and those with disabilities is we don't have access to funding, uh, so to speak. So in the cannabis world, you can't just go into a bank and get a banking loan to open a business, a dispensary, a lab. It's all cash funded money. And the people that generally have those deep pockets tend to be older white males. And unfortunately, that puts a disparage between women going into this business, minorities going into the business, or those with disabilities. They don't oftentimes have these deep pockets. And as states have adopted cannabis into recreational law, they've tacked on different fees and items that you have to pay. So it's very pricey to go into the cannabis industry. How does making connections between women in the industry help? For instance, are there females who can fund some would-be entrepreneurs? 
I've actually been in discussions with a group that I'm working with and told them there needs to be funding for women. If a group of backers or investors on the back end could get together and fund women's projects in this industry, it could be quite um, financially sound for them. So it's, it's just a matter of more groups coming together or even women who are independently wealthy, seeing that this market is a very viable business market and to put their money into this market. Brooke, it's been great chatting with you about your efforts on this front. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that wraps up our show for this week. Join us next week when we look at the business behind the arts in New Jersey, including how local artists are using the blockchain. Thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org.